sorry to interrupt your chat there. I, I forgot that it's my job to start the service. Um, so uh, sorry about that. Um, welcome on Sunday morning to worship our God in Ballinure. Uh, we're really excited to be here today uh, and we just want to uh, say a word of thank you, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, just in case you're visiting today and you want a sense of what's going on in Ballinure, hopefully you got a copy of the bulletin on the way in. Uh, the, don't let the picture in the front put you off, uh, the picture of me and Laura and the kids. Have a read at it, see what's going on, see the kind of things that happen in our church family. Just a couple of things to remind you about today. Promised Land, which is our ministry for primary school kids, and Wired, which is our ministry for secondary school kids, are meeting during the service. If you're here and visiting, the kids from Promised Land should come back during the last song. But if they don't, don't worry. They haven't gone missing. They're just over in the minor hall. So come over and get some tea and coffee and pick them up at the end of the service. And do hang around for that tea and coffee and chat at the end of the service. I just want to say really briefly a quick word of thanks um, to you all, and especially to George and the elders and Sharon and the music team and the folks who made tea for making Friday night such a special and significant night for Laura and Rosie and Ben and I, and for us as a church family. I also want to thank you too for your great generosity. We raised £1,087 for the Students' Bursary Fund, which is money that will go to great use in equipping the next generation of ministers in Union Theological College. Thanks all for helping us to feel welcome. Over the last couple of days, lots of you have sent texts and emails and dropped around food and dropped around sandwiches and buns after Friday night. Thank you so much. We already feel quite welcome in the village and we're looking forward to getting to know you all over the next few weeks, months, and hopefully many, many years. Um, but this morning service doesn't begin with me saying thank you. Incredibly, this morning service begins with our great God speaking to us, speaking to us and calling us to do what we were made to do, to know him, enjoy him, and worship him forever. So hear the great words of God as he speaks to us and calls us to worship in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are also God's child, he has made you an heir. We're going to worship the great God who has saved us by bringing us into his family as we sing two songs together this morning. The Lord is my salvation and I stand amazed. If you're able to stand, please stand and join with me in giving praise to the God of our great salvation. Let's sing together. of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls 
let's turn to our wonderful Savior in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, at the beginning of this new morning, we want to praise you for your relentless faithfulness to us. You have shaped all of history for your glory. All of history, national and international, local and specific. You have moved everything together to unite everything together in Jesus Christ. Things on heaven, things on earth. You're at work to unite them all together in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, your work continues undaunted by our sin your mercy never runs out your mercy always overflows your mercy has paid back all of our debts to you your mercy has secured our victory over sin your mercy means that you are the lord our salvation so lead us back again and again and again to praise you for your mercy to us. Above all, Father, we want to praise you today for your relentless faithfulness to us in sending forth your Son for us. Father, your work is often low and slow and hidden and nowhere is that clearer than in our Lord Jesus Christ. He was born in complete obscurity. He was born in utter poverty. He was born at the lowest ebb in his family's history. But your word tells us that he was born at just the right time, the full time, the time that you had planned because you are relentlessly faithful to us. Father, thank you that your son became one of us. Thank you that he was, as we heard from Galatians 4, born of a woman, taking on a unique family history, taking on all the baggage of our sin and shame and suffering. He was born into a world ruled by sin and death. Thank you that your son became so obedient he was born under the law, humbly observing all of your commandments, commandments that we so quickly break or ignore. He observed them all. Thank you that he went so far for us to give us a whole new beginning, to lift us up into his family, into your family, to adopt us as sons, firstborn precious sons, of heaven's glorious King. Father, that is so humbling and it is so thrilling. And so we simply ask today that you would do what you love to do, that you would send the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, that your Spirit would make us alive to you, make us dependent on you, make us completely defined by our relationship to you, that your spirit would make us cry, Abba, Father. Remind us again and again today that we are no longer slaves to the law. We no longer live dull lives full of drudgery and begrudging moral performance because we are no longer slaves to sin and death. We no longer live reckless and fruitless lives that keep disappointing us because you have made us your sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray today that you would thrill us with Jesus, that he would become increasingly beautiful and increasingly real to us as we sing and listen and pray and think. And we pray this all in Jesus' great and mighty and lovely and worthy name. Amen. Boys and girls, in a minute, you're going to come to the front. Before you do that, we're going to turn to God's Word and read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17.
Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. If you can see one of the Pew Bibles in front of you, you should be able to find it on page 965. Page 965 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. The genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, on page 965 in the Pew Bibles. We read this knowing that this is God's word to us this morning. The genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Adimadab, Adimadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Yotam. Yotam, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel. Sheltiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. Abiud, the father of Elakim. Elakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliud. Eliud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Matan. Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is God's word to us this morning. We're going to think about that in a few minutes, so keep it open in front of you. Before we do that, boys and girls, you want to come down to the front I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of what this passage might mean for you. Is that everyone down? Oh, some people, some more people are coming. Don't worry. We'll, we'll hold fire. We'll hold fire. Have you had a good weekend so far? Give me an you've had a good weekend so far. Anyone do anything fun this weekend? Anyone do anything fun? Nobody did anything fun this weekend? Goodness me. Nobody did anything fun. Anyone do anything boring this weekend? Is that a better question? Oh, what did you do? You had to read your book. That sounds like great fun to me. Was that, was it, bo no, boring, okay. Boring, boring. What did you do? Work. Work. Oh, dear. What did you do? You had to go to a dancing competition with GB, and that was great fun, wasn't it? Good. Somebody did something fun. Watch TV. Good fun. Yes, one more. Played Balmain and Rugby. Did you did you win? Oh, that's okay. Then we don't have to fall out, you know. I'm I know I'm technically from Balmain, you're annoyed, but Balmain still has a little bit of a pool, so that's good. We can't fall out. Anyone play with any Lego this weekend? Did anyone play with any Lego this weekend? Who's got Lego at home? Yeah, I have lots of Lego. In fact, I forgot to bring my Lego with me to show you this morning, but you have to trust me. I've got a great big Lego Millennium Falcon in my study. So if you ever want to come and see it, you just let me know and you can see my great big ship from Star Wars that's sitting in my study. Tell me this, boys and girls. 
Do your mums and dads like it when all your Lego is everywhere, all over the floor, pieces scattered all over the house? Or do you like it when it's all together and neat and tidy? Which one do you think they prefer? Neat and tidy, scattered all over the house? Oh no, how do you think it's scattered and how do you think it's tidy? Hands up for tidy? Oh, hands up for scattered? Oh, is a few scattered? Oh, okay. Um, I think if I was your mum and dad, I think I would like it when it was nice and neat and tidy. Because when it's scattered, you can stand on it and boy, does it hurt. You can lose pieces of it. You can always know that you're going to put your shoes on and find some Lego inside there. When it's scattered, it's messy and it's hard and it can make you trip and fall. And in the passage we're going to think about that we just heard today, we've got two perspectives on life. One perspective is like all the Lego bricks scattered everywhere. It's the perspective that we're going to think about a little bit where everything feels horrible and confusing and messy and full of pain. But Matthew says there's another even better way to think about life. And that's life that is neat and tidy and orderly. And the difference, he says is thinking about life from our perspective or from God's perspective. We think that life is full of ups and downs and twists and turns that seem totally unexpected. Maybe your cat was sick this week. Maybe you had a really hard spelling test this week. Maybe your best friend stopped speaking to you this week. Maybe your TV broke this week. We think life is full of ups and downs, but from God's perspective, everything is neat and tidy and orderly everything is leading in one direction it's all pointing towards one great king and who do you think that king is who do you think the king that everything is pointing to the king that is jesus that's right everything in life god is saying points you love jesus great everything in life is pointing to the king jesus that we are called as you do to know and love So whatever happens this week and all the ups and downs so that God is at work to point everything towards Jesus. We're going to pray together now, then we're going to sing, and you guys are going to head out to Promised Land and Wired. So let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, you know that so often our lives are full of ups and downs, things that we don't understand or know what's going on. And yet, Father, thank you for the great news of the gospel, the great news of the book that we've just read. Father, thank you so much that you are always at work to point everything towards your son. Help us to trust him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together now. Sure, we'll just stand. We're going to sing. And then, boys and girls, you guys can head out to promised land.
Okay, if you're in primary school, you can head out to Promised Land. If you're in secondary school, you can head out to Wired. together from God's word. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we want to take some time now to bring our needs before you. We're really thankful that you're a God who is so gracious. You invite us to bring our most heartfelt needs to you. We're thankful that in the words of Psalm 40, you know that we are poor and needy, but you take thought for us. We know that you are our only help, our only deliverer, and your work and love are so certain and strong. We can boldly ask you this morning not to delay to help us. So Father, we want to take some time this morning to pray especially for those in our church family who know the pain of seemingly unanswered prayer. Prayer prayed with real feeling, real tears, real passion, real faith. Prayer prayed for days, weeks, years. And prayer that you haven't chosen to answer with a yes right now. Whether it's praying for a spouse, a child, a best friend to come to know Jesus, or praying for an end to struggles with anxiety and depression and insecurity, or praying for an end to singleness, childlessness, joblessness, loneliness, or praying for freedom from a particular set of sins and temptations and idols. Father, we confess that kind of prayer is really painful. It really stretches our faith, even as it really breaks our hearts. So we pray today that you would be incredibly kind to us, and that you would hear and answer our deepest, most heartfelt, and most faith-driven prayers. Father, thank you that books like Esther and Job show clear, so clearly show us that your silence is not your absence. Your silence does not mean that you are not at work. But your silence testifies to the fact that the work of the gospel, the work of the kingdom, your work is often so low and slow and hidden. That way is so often the way that you bring glory to your son. That way is so often the way that you work to bring us much good. You paint on the canvas of eternity. So Father, train us to trust you in your silence. Remind us again and again that you care enough about our pain to do something about it. You sent your son to die to bring about the death of death, the death of pain, the death even of seemingly unanswered prayer. Thank you that one soon coming day, we will know that you hear our voices and we will forever see how quick you are to answer us. Father, we want to thank you this morning that your son knows what it is to pray and not get the answer he looked for. Praying in the garden before the cross, take this cup from me and hearing a no from you. Thank you that that response to your son's prayer is the reason that we are worshipping you today. So please, Father, give us perseverance, give us persistence, and give us more faith. Help us to pray and keep praying when you seem silent. Help us to do so trusting in the unending, faithful work of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read Matthew chapter 1. We've already read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. 
we're going to spend some time thinking about these verses together now. I guess the, the big question I want to start with this morning is this. When you stay in a hotel, when you're away on holiday and you stay in a hotel, what is always the one thing that you want? Like more than a spa, more than a super fancy TV, more than a kettle, even more than the complimentary breakfast, what is the one thing you always want when you're on holiday in a hotel? You want a sea view, don't you? You want to be able to see some mountains? You want to see the city skyline stretch out before your eyes? You want to begin every morning of your stay totally amazed. You don't want to be looking at the car park. Like you don't want to open your curtains and see the bins in the morning. You don't want to open your curtains and hey presto, it's another brick wall. You want an incredible view. You want to wake up every morning of your stay and lose an hour simply just staring out the window. You want to be amazed at what you can see. Here's the second question. What do you think would happen if you moved there? What do you think would happen if you permanently settled in that hotel room? If that window became the only window of your entire life? Well, that originally stunning landscape would start to become normal, wouldn't it? And basic and boring. And you might find yourself spending less and less time looking at it, less and less time staring at its beauty, and more and more time glued to your newspaper or your phone or to the TV, you might stop being surprised by what you see. Maybe you're wondering why we're spending so much time a sort of a new series exploring Matthew's gospel, thinking about hotel rooms and hotel windows. Well, the reason is, if we're honest, we might confess that something like that keeps happening in our hearts with Jesus. We might confess that that dynamic is always working to different extents and to different degrees in our hearts towards Jesus. Over time, Jesus starts to become normal. Over time, Jesus stops surprising us. When we saw Jesus for the first time, we were stunned. He knocked our socks off. He flipped our lives upside down. His love seemed too good to be true. His grace seemed so amazing. His power seemed utterly unstoppable. And then, weeks, months, years, decades of discipleship have trickled by. And we find ourselves taking these things, these wonderful, amazing, surprising things about Jesus, we find ourselves taking them for granted. We're singing, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. I was going to sing this, but I didn't want to start on that note. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Kind of bored by the truth that we're singing. Kind of bored by his love. If we're honest, so often Jesus seems so normal, so basic, so boring. Do you feel like that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Does that describe you today? Maybe you're exploring Christianity and it feels that like you've kind of hit a roadblock. You now know lots of stories about Jesus. You now know lots of bits of truth about Jesus. Now you know lots of answers to your very hardest questions, but it hasn't done anything to you. It hasn't seemed to click for you. It hasn't led you to take that next risky, world-changing step of faith. Maybe you've been a Christian for as long as you can remember. You've read your Bible cover to cover and back again so many times. You know where specific verses sit on specific pages of your favorite Bible. You know when every prayer, song, sermon begins, exactly how it's going to end. And it all feels a bit stale, a bit rote, a bit bland, a bit lifeless. Does that describe you today? Well, to get us out of that funk, to break the power of that dynamic in our hearts, there is literally only one cure. That's what we're going to do together for the next nine weeks and hopefully for the next 90 years. We need to listen to Scripture and so become surprised by Jesus all over again. We need to listen to Scripture and encounter our surprising Savior 
all over again. For the next nine weeks, we're going to explore Matthew's gospel. We're going to work our way from Matthew chapter 1 to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to do one thing that entire time. We're going to stare at our Savior. We're going to ask him to shock our hearts and surprise us again with his power and his glory and his mercy and his grace. We want to become surprised by Jesus, our rescuer, our substitute, our hero, our king, all over again. Does that sound good? Sound like a plan? Well, with all that said, why on earth did I start this series by reading you a long, hard to pronounce, barely comprehensible family tree? Like, why start this series here? Couldn't I have just skipped forward to something decent in Matthew's gospel? You know, like a really insightful parable or a really inspiring miracle or the cross or the resurrection or the great commission. And maybe, maybe if you had some spare time at the end of the series in a few years' time, maybe circle back to this genealogy. Like, sure, family trees are really interesting. I can't wait to piece together Ballyneur's interwoven family tree. I can't wait to work out who is related to who. That's a good bit of fun, but exciting, invigorating, revitalizing, maturing. I don't think it's going to do that, is it? It's like expecting you to jump for joy at the terms and conditions that come at the end of a radio, radio advertisement. It's like expecting you to jump for joy when you hear 18% APR subject to lender's approval. It's like that to take your breath away. Isn't that crazy? Well, it gets even stranger when you realize what's happening in Matthew's gospel. Do you know what happened before Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17? Nothing. Zilch, nada, silence. You can flick over one page, but that page represents 400 years without a single word from God. 400 years of silence from God. 400 years of wondering, is God still there? Is God ever going to speak again? Is God really as good as I thought he was? I just think about the last time you were in a dentist's waiting room and everyone else came and went and your name never seemed to reach the speaker in the waiting room and you spent 40 minutes just sitting there in complete silence. How painful was that wait? How painful was 40 minutes in a waiting room? Imagine multiplying that time by 5 million 256,000 long, slow, grinding minutes. From the last word of Malachi to the first word of Matthew, 400 years of agonizing silence. Assuming that God must be done with us now, his promises must be pipe dreams, our future is going to stay half finished because his voice is never going to speak again. And then this, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, this is how God chooses to break that silence. This is how God chooses to affirm his presence. This is how God announces to us the beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that so strange? Isn't that so weird? Isn't that so surprising? Why is God doing this? Well, he wants them in the first century and us in Ballinur to realize one simple, stunning, overwhelming, glorious truth. To learn one truth about our rescuer, our redeemer, our substitute, our king. If you're taking notes, this is the only point today, just one point today. This family tree is how God proves to us that he is relentlessly faithful. These verses prove to us that our God is relentlessly faithful. In this family tree, it's like God is dragging us back to that hotel window that has bored us for years and reminding us about the most stunning of stunning vistas this beautiful landscape that was always before our eyes that we managed in our folly to forget. Our God is relentlessly faithful. Take a look with me 
at verse 17. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Now honestly, this verse is kind of confusing. It's generally stumped God's people for generations. It's partly because Matthew leaves some people out of his family tree. If you want to check later on, you can flick over to Luke chapter 3, verses 22 to 36. And there you'll spot some names, some ancestors of Jesus, that don't make the cut in Matthew's family tree. But Matthew is not making lots of mistakes from verse 1. Uh, for one thing, the father of so-and-so is a really flexible phrase. Like, like We know that instinctively, don't we? You might have an aunt who has literally no biological connection to you. You cannot explain why you call her auntie, but you still do. You might say, my granny was like a mum to me. She raised me. We know that works. It's the same kind of idea here. Father and father of so-and-so is really flexible. It can mean grandfather of so-and-so. It can cover multiple generations. Now, he's making lots of mistakes from verse 1. But also, Matthew doesn't tell us in verse 17, there's three sets of 14 generations. So we can work out how long this all took. Matthew doesn't want us to age or date the planet or to try and trace God's plans to the nearest hour or minute. Matthew is doing something much more important in this one verse. With these three sets of 14 generations, Matthew wants to show you how relentlessly faithful God has been to his people. Matthew wants you to see how relentlessly faithful God has been to you. Matthew is saying in verse 17, this family tree isn't wild, it isn't a weed, it isn't the product of chance, it has been deliberately cultivated by God's hands. Now, do you hear the significance of that? From the ground, from our perspective, history looks like chaos. History looks wild, history looks unpredictable. But from the heavens, from God's perspective, there is order, structure, logic, purpose underpinning the jumble of our lives. All because God paints, God gardens, God farms on the landscape of eternity. Verse 17 says 14, 14, 14 to make you realize God has been perfect, perfectly preparing the stage for Jesus for all of history. God has been perfectly preparing the stage to rescue you, to redeem you, to love you for all of history. He is relentlessly faithful. Maybe some of you have been following some of the stuff in the news about the post office scandal. Maybe you watch the show on ITV. You might know that more than 900 postmasters were prosecuted after some glitchy computer software made it look like lots of money was missing. They were all innocent, but some were imprisoned in high security prisons. Some lost their homes. Some lost their friends. Some lost early years with their kids. Some lost their lives. It's been called the biggest miscarriage of justice in British legal history. And yet today, in January 2024, a different outcome seems inevitable. Now it seems that justice will be done and names will be cleared and families will be vindicated and compensation will be paid and evil will be overthrown. It didn't feel like that in 1999 or in 2009. It didn't feel like that in the thick of it. It didn't feel like that when you were waving goodbye to your kids from the back of a police car. But having the long view of history changes things. It changes the story entirely. That is how Matthew wants you to feel today when you read verse 17. God is relentlessly faithful, he's saying. He relentlessly works across time, across space, to keep his promises to his people, to funnel his people towards his son, to funnel you towards his love, to unite all things together in Jesus Christ. His time management spans centuries. His plans span continents. 
His work is so often hidden. But God is never like that solicitor that you always need to badger to complete your mortgage. God is never like that plumber who never shows up to fix your leaky pipe. God is relentlessly faithful, Matthew is saying. He has pledged to save you because he wants to save you. So his promises will always come true. His rescue will never fail. His love will always win. Nothing, nothing in life, no sickness, no tragedy, no grief, no despair, no diagnosis, no disappointment, no suffering, nothing can derail or undercut or redirect God's relentless faithfulness to you. I know that the next week, the next year, the next decade in Ballymure might bring all sorts of challenges and hardship and headache and heartache and exhaustion and burnout and tears to your life and to my life. And yet none of that could ever hope to stop our relentlessly faithful God's word and work. None of that could ever stop God's relentless commitment to setting everything right in worship of him. Now I know right now that some of you are definitely thinking something like this. That's all well and good. That is a lovely sounding idea. But I don't see that working for me. I don't see that working in the grit and grime and mess of my life. I don't see how God could use my mistakes, my redundancy, my breakup, my bankruptcy for anything close to my good. Well, if you're thinking that right now, Let's take a close look at the kind of people that Matthew, that God includes in this family tree. Just start with Isaac in verse 2. Yes, Isaac was the child of the promise. But Isaac was a grumpy old dad who loved to play favorites with his kids. Jacob, his son, was a trickster, a liar, and a cheat. Judah and his brothers conspired to murder one of their brothers settled with selling him into slavery and then convinced their father that their brother had been mauled to death by wolves. And that is the first branch of the family tree. We've only got as far as verse 2. Rehoboam in verse 7 was so hard-headed, he started a civil war that set brother against brother and ruined the kingdom for years. Joram in verse 8 naively trusted his enemies right until the point where they stabbed him in the back. Uzziah in verse 9 went so rogue that he disobeyed God's word and came down with a serious case of leprosy. Hezekiah in verse 10 lived too long and finished his race of discipleship with a complete whimper. Manasseh in verse 10 literally sacrificed his own kids on the altar of his prosperity. And who knows anything about Achim, Eliud, and Matan, the people who we meet in verses 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. No one buys their autobiographies in ancient Israeli Asda because they are so unimportant in the eyes of human history. Like, do you see Matthew's point? Can you hear the point of the family tree right now? Matthew is utterly realistic in his depiction of us. This is a warts and all kind of expose because Matthew is utterly realistic in his certainty of God's relentless faithfulness. Matthew wants you to know that nothing in your life, nothing, not even the lowest moments of sin, not even your most profound regrets, nothing in your life can resist God's relentless faithfulness, God's unending commitment to rescue you, to save you, and fill you with his limitless love. Never think that God's faithfulness is a Jenga tower, wobbly, teetering, liable to collapse when it encounters the smallest whiff of our darkness. God's faithfulness is like a skyscraper, God's faithfulness is like the subway that goes underneath the road outside. It is unbending, 
unbreaking, unyielding, unrelenting. There is nothing in you, no darkness at all, that God's relentless faithfulness cannot overcome. No sin, no suffering, no death, no decay, because he is relentlessly faithful. But there's something more you need to realize this morning. When it comes to God's relentless faithfulness, there's something even more surprising at work in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Look for a second at verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. These verses are not just about God's relentless faithfulness in shaping history, overcoming darkness like a master gardener. These verses are about our Savior's complete willingness to jump, our Savior's relentless willingness to jump into the mud of our lives, to rescue us, to save us, to set us free, to make us holy, to make us one with our God again. Jesus is set apart by God. That's what Messiah or Christ means. Jesus is set apart by God to rule and to bring peace. That's what the son of David means. Jesus is set apart by God to make happiness extend from shore to shore, to secure our position before God, our God, his people, to secure our position before God forever. That's what the son of Abraham means. Jesus is set apart by God to offer us a new Genesis, to offer you a whole new beginning, a whole new beginning that makes sense of everything that's gone before because it changes the goal and point and purpose and arc of your life. It makes everything in your life about him. But how? How does our relentlessly faithful Savior offer you a new beginning this morning? Matthew says by diving into the darkest bits of human experience, by bearing the weight of them on his shoulders, by breaking them, sin, darkness, and death, breaking them completely. Did you notice something really interesting about Jesus' family tree? There's a clear pattern when you look at the verses. Look at verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. There's this pattern, father of, father of, father of. But Matthew breaks it in verses 3, 5, 6, and 16. In those verses, he introduces us to five mothers of Jesus, five significant women in Jesus' life. And the crazy thing is, none of these women are the women you would want to pick. <laughs> these, women are, these women are not the kind of women you'd want to discover when they did your Who Do You Think You Are on BBC One. I wonder, as a, has a distant American relative ever contacted you? because they've been researching their family tree. Every so often, my Facebook goes off with another Kelso who wants to get me into their family tree. Don't they want you in your family tree for what you bring to them? They get to boast, I'm 100% Irish, when they find one of us in their family tree. Well, these women give Jesus nothing to boast about. Tamar, in verse 3, hung around some dodgy back streets of Canaan to seduce her father-in-law. Rahab, in verse 5, was a woman of negotiable virtue, running a house for a woman of negotiable virtue. Ruth, in verse 5, was a foreigner suspected of seducing the most upstanding member of her community. The wife of Uriah, in verse 6, was involved in one of the murkiest scandals in Israel's political history. And Mary, in verse 16, Mary was the woman that everyone mocked when she left the room. These women give Jesus nothing to boast about. In fact, these women bring a heady mix of sin and suffering into Jesus' family tree. They bring a mix of scandals and skeletons into Jesus' closet. But can you hear what Matthew is saying? Can you hear something incredible? Listen to a French pastor describe these verses. He says, The Son of God might have kept his descent to us from heaven's holy throne, unspotted and pure from every reproach or mark of infamy. But he takes it all on his shoulders. 
he makes it all part of his descent to us. Jesus is relentlessly faithful. He is so faithful, he is going to deal with our darkness, deal with our sin, deal with our greatest problems by digging them up from the root. These women, these men, they give Jesus nothing to boast about. And yet he willingly takes on this history. He makes himself part of this family tree because he wants to take on the messed up baggage of our sin and our suffering from the very second that he is conceived to heal us and save us and set us free. There is no family drama, no hidden skeleton in the closet, no horrific past that Jesus, by opting into this family tree, cannot heal. Do you hear that? Do you believe that? No darkness in you can withstand a saviour so faithful. Nothing can shut you out, out of God's promises, out of God's love, out of God's people, when you pin your hopes to this kind of relentlessly faithful saviour. There's an old bishop in Liverpool, J.C. Ryle, who once said, one who humbled himself like this will never be ashamed to call you my brother, my sister, my friend. One who humbled himself like this from the very beginning of his descent to us will never be ashamed to call you my brother, my sister, my friend. Do you see what this means? Maybe you know that these words are written at the very bottom of the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe three, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. That is what Jesus Christ is saying to you today. Through his family tree, he wants to take your life exactly at where it is tired or wretched or tempest-tossed, exactly at where it is marred by sin and suffering. And he wants to set you free. He wants to bring you to him so you can breathe three again. Don't you want to run to a saviour so faithful? Don't you want to let that kind of saviour into the hidden corners of your life? Don't you want him to set you free? Just before we finish, let me make this really abundantly practical. For all of us, there will come a point. Maybe next week, maybe next June, whenever. For all of us, there will come a point when life is going to feel incredibly overwhelming and you will not want to come to church. Maybe your dog has just died. Maybe your marriage is crumbling. Maybe your machinery is all broken. Maybe your exams are stressing you out. For all of us, there will come a point at some stage when we just don't want to face church. And we will think at that moment, I need a breather. You need to fix this or that first. You need to stop messing up here or there first. When that happens, I would love you to flick back to Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17 and read Jesus' family tree and remember that he came to save those who know how horrendous their sin is. He came to save those who know how wearingly wrong their suffering is. He came for the tired poor, wretched, and lowly. And knowing that, I would love you to come. Come weak, come needy, come vulnerable, come raw, come gasping for breath. But come to church, come to worship, and fix your eyes on the relentlessly faithful Savior. It is only as you hear the gospel, as you hear of Jesus' great love for his Father, as you hear of Jesus' great love for you, Love that drove him to take on this history. Love that drove him to down to the cross. Love that drove him down to the grave. Love that drove him down to destroy death. It is only as you hear this gospel that you will start to breathe free. That you will find a whole new beginning even at your lowest point. Because that is the surprising way 
a relentlessly faithful Savior loves to work. When you feel that you cannot face church, remember that one who humbled himself like this is never ashamed to call you my sister, my brother, my friend. And so run to him. Let's pray together and then we're going to sing. Father, you know us. You know our history. You know our family tree. You know the complex web of sin and suffering that has been woven over our lives. And yet your son came down to us. He stepped into our world to take it all on his shoulders and so to set us free. Father, help us to be surprised today by a saviour so relentlessly faithful. Help us to respond to him in faith and to cling to him as our only hope in life and death. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able to stand, please stand with me. We're going to sing Christ, our hope in life and death as we prepare to go out into our weeks marred by sin and suffering. If you're able to stand, let's sing.
and with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Please hang about for tea and coffee, everyone. We love a bit of chat.